World News Today, brought to you by the Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important overseas stations, as well as leading news centers of our own country, CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battlefronts. But first, here's Doug Edwards. American troops have captured San Pietro, one of the strongest points in the German winter line across Italy. Reports from the front describe the battle as one of the bloodiest of the war. In Russia, the Germans report heavy fighting near the Polish frontier in White Russia. American forces are still making progress on New Britain Island in the southwest Pacific, and on Bougainville, our troops have begun a drive into the jungles northeast of the Empress Augusta Bay bridgehead. And from London comes word that Prime Minister Churchill continues to improve The signs of pneumonia are disappearing. Now for our first news from overseas, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Algiers, Winston Burdett reporting. American troops have smashed through the Mignano gateway to the road to Rome. After ten days of savage fighting, our infantry yesterday stormed and captured the German stronghold of San Pietro, and so won their first vantage point to the north of the road leading westward to our next objective, Cassino. There has been no fiercer battle in the Italian campaign than this. San Pietro was taken only after American troops in a series of frontal attacks had seized nearly all of the encompassing craggy heights to the north, east, and south. The actual capture of San Pietro climaxed 72 hours of non-stop day and night fighting. The last assault began yesterday morning. By one o'clock in the afternoon, after a downpour of Allied bombs and shells had shattered the last German defenses, Our infantry and tanks went crashing into and around the village and through the defile westward. San Pietro is now a heap of smoking rubble, pulverized by artillery fire, mortar fire, and every other kind of fire that has been pouring into it from our batteries on the heights. Latest reports say that we are pushing our patrols well forward and are now threatening San Vittore two and a half miles to the west. Our troops have opened the door to the wide, flat, leery valley and they have won one of the decisive battles of the war in Italy. Behind the fighting lines in Sicily, the United States Army Counterintelligence Corps has turned up one of the best fascist underground stories of the Italian occupation. Fifteen young men and one woman are under arrest at Trapani for taking part in what is officially called a plot to organize the rebirth of fascism. On October 14th, our intelligence agents saw posted on various buildings in Trapani, tiny mimeographed bulletins denouncing President Roosevelt and claiming lack of bread, clothes, and work. The manifestos ended with the words, Long live revolutionary Sicily. The plot behind the manifestos was revealed by a Sicilian informant who wrote a letter in pidgin English to the intelligence corps giving the names of all the persons who were later arrested. The self-confessed leader of the group is Cataldo Grammatico, 20-year-old university student. Thirteen of his fellow conspirators confessed. Acts of sabotage and wire cutting since the Allied occupation were admitted. Quantities of Italian army equipment, arms and ammunition, propaganda leaflets and copies of radio harangues by Hitler were seized. Signed confessions revealed the plan to stage an armed uprising. Most of the arrested persons are students. As conspirators, they seem to be amateurs. As a conspiracy, this was a fairly easy nut for the intelligence corps to crack. What will be much harder will be to re-educate a generation of young Italians who know of nothing better to live for than Mussolini's fascism. I return you now to CBS in New York. More news in just a moment, but first here is Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. On previous Admiral programs, you've heard many stories of the deeds of our fighting men. Stories of the uses these men are making of the electronic instruments now being turned out at top speed at both great Admiral plants. But today, Admiral would like you to hear a letter, one that might have been written by almost any boy in the service. There is no need trying to tell you that this Christmas is not going to be different, for it is a lot different. But no matter where we may be, there's one thing you can be sure of. Every one of us will be thinking of home... And the Christmas he imagines is being celebrated there. Of course, we realize that things aren't the same for you at home, either. Shortages, people working harder than ever before, vacant chairs, like mine. 
But even so, the Christmas we like to think you'll soon enjoy is the one we knew, just as it was, without any changes. I think most of us out here would like to know that you at home are carrying on just as if we were with you, and I just stepped out to the corner for a minute. Yes, these are thoughts that will probably be in many a boy's mind at this time, our third Christmas at war. And Admiral joins in their unvoiced hope that by the time another Christmas rolls around, there will be no need for pretending that our boys, now scattered at the far corners of the earth, will be home with us again, that the workers at the Admiral plants will be devoting their efforts to peacetime production, to the building of the new Admiral, America's smart set. Now, here once again is Doug Edwards. The German radio continues to furnish news on the fighting in Russia. Berlin reports full-scale battles in the naval area of White Russia. And dispatches from Stockholm say the Germans regard the situation as extremely serious. The German news agency, which reported earlier that the Russians had closed an iron ring around naval, 70 miles from the old Polish border, now claims the Red Army lines have been broken. The Russians are said to be using heavy armored formations in support of this drive. But there is still no word from Moscow to deny or confirm the enemy stories. From Kharkov comes the verdict in the first war criminal trials of World War II. The Soviet military tribunal has convicted four men, one a Russian traitor, of having participated in the mass slaying of Soviet prisoners and civilians. All four have been sentenced to death by hanging. They offered but one defense that they were carrying out orders from Hitler and Himmler to destroy what the Nazi leaders called the inferior Russian race. And now for a summary of the situation on the Eastern Front, here is Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott. It seems highly probable that the German reports of heavy Russian attacks southwest of Naval, which Mr. Edwards has just told you about, may be of considerable significance. It would not be the first time that the news of the Russian advances has come to us from German sources well in advance of any Russian communique on the subject. The Russians have a habit of allowing an operation, especially one of their offensives, to develop for several days before mentioning it officially. The reason this German report seems important is that military observers have for some time been anticipating a shift of Russian offensive emphasis to the north, where the ground is now frozen, and where marshes, rivers, and lakes have ceased to be, for the time being, the barriers to military maneuver, which they are in the summer and fall. The area Nivelvitebsk is, so to speak, the hinge of the German defense line in North Russia. It represents the junction between the German army group of the north and that of the center. The German line from Leningrad to Vitebsk is that part of the front where the German communications are now longest and most difficult. And considering the German necessity for shortening fronts and shortening lines of communication in Russia, this part of the front is that from which a German withdrawal might naturally be anticipated in due course. No doubt the eventual German plan may be to swing their left flank back from Leningrad along the shore of the Gulf of Finland, perhaps to Lake Pipus, perhaps as far back as the River Dvina. The Russians will not wish to permit the Germans to do this undisturbed and at the chosen German moment. In order to prevent it, the best method is to strike heavily at the hinge of this swinging German door, which is the fortress area of Vitebsk. Hence, a Russian advance southwest of Naval, which threatens to outflank and envelop Vitebsk, is one which the Germans must find the means to resist. If they do not, then they run the peril of having the whole of their north wing cut off and surrounded, backed up against the Baltic shore, just as the Russians recently tried to back the whole of their south wing up against the coast of the Black Sea. But it hasn't come to that yet. These are merely conjectures. That was Major George Fielding Elliott. Millions of Americans have sent Christmas letters and packages to men overseas. For a description on just how the Navy handles this staggering transportation problem, Admiral Radio takes you to the Fleet Post Office, New York, Bill Slocum, Jr., reporting. Two and one-half million Christmas gifts, each one holding no more than five pounds of trinkets, and each one holding no less than a million tons of cheer and happiness for American sailors have or are passing over a table I am now sitting on. It's a long, rough table in the center of the parcel post division of the Fleet Post Office, New York. If you send something to a sailor or merchant seaman marked Fleet Post Office, New York, you can be sure it landed here, was sorted, flipped with unbelievable accuracy into a rack of huge baskets, and sent on its way. If you and some 50,000 of you did, 
wrap it badly, you can be sure your carelessness was greeted with appropriate comment and then slowly, painstakingly corrected by sweating sailors who repacked your parcel. Normally, 400,000 letters clear here daily and 25,000 parcels. The Christmas rush was so well handled that Lieutenant Andrew Newton, officer in charge here, said there was a minor Christmas rush after the first one. V-mail, airmail, first-class mail and parcels headed for men at sea come here from the post office. There's a tiny office here that bears a legend, please keep out. I knew it was important because it was the first official please I had ever seen in the Navy. And this tiny office is the location of every single ship in the United States Navy. It is the heart of the entire operation here. A few men, and very few, have access to that office. Incorrect addressing is the post office's biggest headache. Downstairs, dozens of waves are attempting to list the correct addresses of every officer and enlisted man in the Navy. But there are almost two and a half million men in our Navy, and the New York office alone lists 2,500 J. Smiths, 500 James Smiths, 4,500 assorted Joneses. And that's not counting officers. Strange things happen here. The parcel post wrappers are hard to surprise, but among their more recent major shocks were two quarts of ice cream, or rather two X quarts of X ice cream, mailed to Bizzerti, a pair of dead trout bound for England, and a very live queen bee destined for a Navy lieutenant in Africa. Baby dishes, teddy bears, washboards, and girdles have also popped out of badly wrapped packages. I am solemnly assured that never in the history of Fleet Post Office New York has a bottle of anything alcoholic been found except hair tonic. Plenty of bolognese and historic cheese, though. Fleet Post Office is thorough. To make sure there is no hitch, it had a code, number assigned to Casablanca and Naples many, many months before they were necessary. They already have a code number assigned to Tokyo, but they won't tell me the number. Seems they picked a year for the code, and they don't want to sound too optimistic. Now back to Admiral Radio. London announces today that Prime Minister Churchill continues to improve in his sickbed somewhere in the Middle East. An official bulletin says Mr. Churchill's temperature has returned to normal and the signs of pneumonia are disappearing. It's generally agreed that the Prime Minister will need quite some time for recuperation. And London papers suggest that Mr. Roosevelt may become the traveler for the next big Anglo-American war conference. London newspapers are also paying quite some attention to the matter of a second front, and they have a new suggestion on just who will lead that drive across the channel. First, unconfirmed reports in both Washington and London had General Marshall in the driver's seat. More recently, after the Tehran conference, we began to get reports that not Marshall, but Eisenhower would be the top man. And now, London papers suggest that the Allied leader will be a Briton, not an American. And as the two most likely candidates... They named General Sir Harold Alexander, Chief of Allied Ground Forces in the Mediterranean War Zone, and General Sir Henry Maitland Wilson, the Allied Commander in the Middle East. American forces in the Central Pacific are preparing their bases in the Gilberts and continuing to attack Jap strongholds in the Marshalls. For a report on this war zone, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Pearl Harbor. Webley Edwards reporting. Civilians and men of the armed forces in this long, blacked-out, dimmed-out place got a Christmas present from the military governor this morning. Effective tomorrow night and every night, lights, wonderful, bright lights, until 10 p.m. After that, inky blackout as usual. In New Britain, American troops have further consolidated their gains on the recently occupied Alloway Peninsula and have captured Umtigalo Village, it is announced. As Christmas week moves into the Pacific War area, the situation out here is one of growing pressure on the Japanese. The occupation of the Gilbert Islands placed a tension spot on his outer defenses. Thereafter, he's been jabbed steadily in the marshals north of the Gilberts by clock-like 7th AAF raids and by one jolting fleet raid by task forces and strength. And then the Pacific fleet further added to the tension by probing deep inside his outer defenses 11 days ago to bombard Nauru Island. The 7th AAF raids have continued thereafter in the marshals drumming in with big liberators to drop no great bomb tonnages due to the flight distances, but eternally hammering away. And now, just as the whereabouts of the Pacific fleet must be giving the Japs the jitters, the fleet has not officially been reported since the Nauru bombardment December 8th, 
American forces have jabbed into the Jap defense rim to add pressure at still another point on this Alloway Peninsula of New Britain Island. The same island where the big harbor of Rabaul is located. And over across from Rabaul on the other side, the pressure continues with the fighting on Bougainville Island. Four weeks ago today on this same broadcast, Brigadier General William J. Flood, Chief of Staff of the 7th AAF, said prophetically, spread them out and sock them looked like a good motto for the Central Pacific. Even as, as he said it, Admiral Nimitz's big Pacific fleet forces were going into the Gilberts. Since then, the spread them out and sock them policy has spread indeed through most of the Central, Southwest, and South Pacific. With pressure against the Jap built up until it breaks through again to touch him in another vital spot, as was done in the Gilberts. This is Webley Edwards at Pearl Harbor. I return you to Admiral Radio in New York. Germany this week continued to watch for signs of the coming invasion. For a report direct from one of the few neutral listening posts on the continent, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Madrid. Glenn Stadler reporting. The law of diminishing returns appears to be operating among Hitler's satellites. Indications are that it's working well in Hungary, where there have been strong demands for immediate return of troops from Russia. These number about 60,000, but because the Germans won't permit a withdrawal, they face either being killed, captured, or pushed back home. In Hungary itself, there are about 450,000 soldiers, many guarding against attacks by Yugoslavs. Romania's situation is similar. As early as two months ago, reports from Bucharest told of demands for the return of their troops. Romania is more valuable to the Nazis as a source of oil, but also has 100,000 soldiers in Russia. They have occupied Odessa since its capture by German stormtroopers more than two years ago. Slovakia has about 60,000 men in Russia and keeps 30,000 at home. Bulgaria is not at war with Russia, but declared war on us. However, an odd story from Sofia today says the Bulgarians began to fight communism even before communism existed. They have an army of about 325,000, of which 60,000 are quartered in Greece and 100,000 in Yugoslavia. Thus, Hitler's Balkan allies show, on paper at least, a force of more than one million and a quarter. This includes six or seven air assault commando divisions made up of so-called volunteers from the occupied countries, but really contain a large majority of Nazi regulars. In the north, Finland with 20 divisions, aligned with Germany, is at war with Russia, but not with the United States. Here in Madrid, where the war seems far away, entertainment has taken on a more decided international aspect. Tonight, Draco and his Polanyi leaders will attend the Spanish version of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. In another theater, the Scala Vaudeville Show for Berlin features a Japanese dancer giving an oriental interpretation of the Negro song, St. Louis Blues. This is Gun Sadler in Madrid, returning you to Admiral Radio in New York. Now for a report on home front developments and an interview with a WAC captain recently returned from Britain, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Washington. Don Pryor reporting. Washington is getting ready for Christmas. Congress will adjourn formally Tuesday afternoon and go home for the holidays, leaving taxes, subsidies, the soldier vote, mustering out pay, and other issues to be ironed out in the new year. President Roosevelt and most of his family will have a quiet celebration of their own at Hyde Park. The president also will make his customary Christmas Eve address to the nation, except that it will be at 3 o'clock in the afternoon this time, and it will be directed primarily to fighting men around the world. Just a few minutes ago, President Roosevelt began an urgent conference at the White House with railroad and union officials in an effort to head off the threatened strike of operating railroad men. The strike is set for December 30th, but private information here is that the unions will postpone the deadline, using the threat as a lever to force negotiation of their wage demands. They want $3 a day more. Selective Service said last night that a million fathers will be drafted by July 1st. We've brought you a lot of heroes on this program, but it can't be emphasized too much that wars aren't fought alone by heroes. Most of it is done by potential heroes, just plain G.I.s, and this time by women, too. So our Washington guest today is a woman soldier, Captain Catherine E. Falby of the Women's Army Corps. Before the war, she was elected to the Massachusetts legislature, and she's still a member. She was a practicing lawyer in Boston, a member of the United States Supreme Court Bar. But don't let that mislead you. She's also petite and very attractive. Captain Falvey, what branch of the Army are you working for right now? The Army Service Forces. Well, you haven't been in that very long, though. What were you doing before that? I was in England. I went over there last summer, in June, to help get an organization set up 
before the first WAC battalion was sent across. Well, were you one of the first to go over there? No, I was in the fourth group. Two officers went over last winter to establish, establish liaison with the British WAFs, who had been loaned to the 8th Air Force while our WACs were being trained. Then Major Wilson went over to take charge as WAC director, along with her assistant, Lieutenant Herbert. They were followed in May by six officers and five enlisted women. I didn't get there until about two months later with three other officers. Well, how did the soldiers over there react to you women? They, <clears throat> they would just walk up to you and say, Stand still. Let me hear you say something. Oh, and what did you say? I was stopped. I couldn't find a word. Of course, most of the attention was paid to the five enlisted girls. They could have lost their heads just as easily as not, but they didn't. Not one of them. They brushed it all off and let it be known they were there to do a job. And speaking of jobs, what types of jobs do most of the WACs do over there now? Oh, all kinds. According to the latest count, I believe WACs are doing at least 155 jobs. All the way from cooking, stenography, driving cars, to plotting bomber courses, and coordinating the big air raids over Germany. And what was your job there? Was it secret? Not entirely. I was on Major Wilson's staff at headquarters. And how about the British, Captain Falvey? The British women, for instance, what was their reaction when you wax arrived in England? All of them I met were extremely kind and generous. They were very much impressed by our manner of speaking and our uniforms, especially our stockings. They also wore rayon, and they couldn't believe that ours were rayon and not silk, and just plain G.I. rayon, too. As for the British people as a whole, you can tell by their faces they have gone through an ordeal. Well, I wish we had time for more details. Captain Falvey I'd says like... that America's women, uh, America needs a lot more women in the Army. Each one of them can take over a vital Army job, and the Army can use hundreds of thousands of them. And I hope hundreds of thousands join. That was Captain Catherine E. Falvey of the Women's Army Corps. I return you to Admiral Radio in New York. And now here's a message from Admiral Radio. You know, your Admiral Dealer is a busy man these days. With production of civilian radios completely halted and everyone faced with the necessity of making their present equipment last for the duration, radio repair men are literally swamped. If your set fails to operate perfectly, however, there are certain things you can do before calling your dealer. Certain checks to determine if there is actually a structural failure. For instance, tubes sometimes jar loose. And all that's necessary is to push them back firmly in place again. As a wartime service to you in helping to keep your set in working order, and to help save the time of your busy dealer, Admiral has prepared a home checkup chart listing some 20 things you can do before calling your dealer. All you need do to obtain one of these charts is ask for it at your Admiral dealer's or address a letter or card to Admiral Radio in care of this station. The simple directions on the home checkup chart may save you the expense of a service call. Get an Admiral home checkup chart from your dealer or drop a card now to the station to which you are listening. The Christmas holidays always place a heavy burden upon our transportation facilities. This year, with thousands of servicemen going home on Christmas furloughs, the strain will be greater than ever before. Let's give these boys a personal priority on the available space in our buses and trains. Don't travel unless your trip is vital to the war effort. Those who must travel will find little pleasure in it. Trains will be crowded. Many will have to stand. But more important than this, one casual, unnecessary pleasure trip may be the cause of some serviceman failing to see his family for the last time before going overseas. If a vacation is necessary, wait until after the middle of January before leaving. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by the Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Be sure... World News Today by shortwave, direct from leading news centers of the world. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago.